Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is especially for the pediatricians and the neonatologists. So I'm happy that you all came. I don't know if the cardiologists are uh, uh, having breakfast at the moment. <laughs> we apologise to you for um, taking extra time yesterday on the sessions and, and actually taking out some of the time that you might have wanted to ask questions. The faculty will be available to you if there are any questions you want to ask um, on uh, any topic uh, that you have in the course. And uh, hopefully tonight we'll get together with pizza and we'll be able to find out more about what your needs are. And our object as faculty is to be always attentive to your needs and to provide you with what you, you need. At the same time, to enlighten you, if you don't mind that, with some of the um, newer and more exciting developments in cardiac imaging uh, that uh, will certainly be useful to you uh, as uh, time passes. Uh, and so I think that uh, the program is structured uh, to not only provide you with basic information, but also to advance um, the areas where um, I think cardiology will be going in the next uh, 10 to 20 years. So we'll try and stay on time today, and uh, um, I think that we've got plenty of time for the strategy discussion. Um, any time that uh, anybody feels they want to interrupt or uh, make a comment or ask a question, please uh, feel free to do so. <clears throat> I don't know whether this pointer is working, um, but it's working today. Thank you. Um, so today we're going to talk about, uh, we put in this session that uh, we couldn't get on yesterday, the ductus arteriosus, because it's such an important um, issue in uh, congenital heart disease. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, ductus imaging. This is a picture I got from Kazawa Mama from a journal, when I saw this, I said, I think that cardiac imaging is all over if they can make these kinds of images in Japan that I thought, oh, Steve, you're here? No. Are you uh, going to begin? Go ahead. You, you have, uh, okay, let me, um, I'll carry on and see where we get to. Um, you sure you don't want to uh, have any introduction? No. Okay. So, Actually, what this is, is uh, this is a uh, fetal rat that he was doing studies with uh, endomethacin in the fetal rats to see the effect of ductus constriction with, uh, with endomethacin. And um, I put them up backwards so that they look like an echocardiogram, but you can see here uh, the pup uh, uh, fetus here, beautifully dissected in cross-section. You can imagine how many rats that they used to actually make these sections almost wiped out the rat population in, um, in Japan. Uh, but you can see here the ductus begins to constrict and then it, uh, it gets more narrow in a, certainly at the pulmonary end and finally uh, constricting even to the point of closure in this uh, fetus. So <coughs> we, that's uh, certainly been an important uh, issue with us for understanding uh, ductus constriction and what uh, we can do therapeutically. Let me just say that uh, um, there uh, seems to be some work in neonatology now that, uh, the, from uh, my institution that says that actually the ductus doesn't alter the morbidity uh, in, uh, in uh, the uh, uh, neonatal population, premature neonatal population. I, I'm actually quite astounded by those figures, but um, a meta-analysis suggests that perhaps uh, the, um, that, uh, that there is more that's been made of the therapeutic nature of uh, ductus uh, closure uh, than, um, than uh, we've been led to believe. And certainly I think that since endomethacin came on the scene, uh, the um, tendency to use endomethacin for ductus closure has become uh, so um, routine that perhaps uh, people have lost sight on the actual indications for, for closing the ductus. <clears throat> so where is the ductus uh, and what is it? Well, we know that it's a tube in fetal life. Here's a fetal echocardiogram showing the main pulmonary artery to the ductus, uh, to the descending aorta, and the ductus begins uh, morphologically uh, after the takeoff of the pulmonary artery uh, this is a, a, a section which is 
been, uh, you can see it's been open, but not completely. And it ends at its entrance uh, of the isthmus into the descending aorta. So it has a length to it and has an aortic end and a, a, a pulmonary end in the middle. And it's become, the ductus used to be just an issue for neonatologists, but it's become much more important because uh, now with the use of ductus occluding devices in children, uh, it's possible to actually close many of these small ductuses and I think really rather successfully um, and making uh, surgery uh, less uh, important. Now just a review um, of, um, of uh, the uh, histology of ductus closure. This is from Dr. Adriana Gittenberger de Groot in uh, Amsterdam. And <coughs> you have um, a diagram on the left showing you what happens on the right. You see this big ductus with the intima and the media here. And then during the course of, um, of uh, closure, there are clefts that develop and lakes. And uh, these uh, proliferate have tissue growing in and finally uh, with the muscle ductus constriction and almost obliteration, although when you section a ligamentum, you frequently find this little endothelial lining in the middle of the, the ligament. Um, also, there is um, proliferation uh, and thrombosis uh, that occurs within the ductus to bring it to a stage of ligamental closure. Now, our biggest problem is how do we quantitate the size of a patent ductus? When is it significant? and when isn't on echo. Now, we all uh, know about uh, the fact that, uh, you know, in, uh, in the choice of, uh, of, of dealing with, with the ductus in, uh, in a cl the clinical situation, that the pulse pressures, respiratory problems, um, and um, uh, just fall off of the, of the general uh, well-being of these uh, infants that have patent ductus uh, that indicate that they have a need for closure. Um, the, the very, very small infants, uh, the ductus will remain open for a substantially longer period of time. <clears throat> the biggest pain in my life as an echocardiographer is the neonatologist that asks us to see whether the ductus is patent on the first day of life. And um, I mean, I'm sure that it doesn't happen in Europe, but in America it happens on a regular basis that people ask you this as a problem with the patient with the ductus. And or, or they think that there's a problem because we know that uh, neonates, uh, their, their uh, specificity for producing symptoms is uh, really quite uh, vague. And so, you know, if the neonate is sick, it must be due to something. And of course, uh, we all believe that our management is so superior that it must be for a system that we're not particularly concerned about. So the neonatologists are always blaming the cardiologists for the problem, and the cardiologists are always blaming the neonatologists for the problem. It makes for one very happy uh, system. And so, um, you know, I think that we get a lot of studies where um, they just want to know what's going on. And on the first day of life uh, in a premature infant, a ductus is a normal phenomenon. The question is the magnitude of the shunt and so on and so forth. And it's really very difficult to evaluate um, um, the whole issue without knowing the clinical <coughs> pictures and so on and so forth. So we need to look at what we can tell the neonatologists. I believe that uh, the ductus is probably normal in the first uh, uh, week of life in a premature infant. Um, and certainly if it's small and it's constricted, it's not the, usually the cause of problems. <coughs> so... We have to document the size of the ductus, and I think a two millimeter ductus in a 1,000 uh, gram infant is a, a big ductus. So you have to know uh, the size of the ductus. A two millimeter ductus in a, in a newborn is obviously not the same significance. So the size is important, and how do we look at the size? And we look at this by a variety of, uh, of imaging uh, issues uh, called the ductus uh, 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 by color, and by a variety of views. Now, diagnosis of a ductus size bigger than 50% of the isthmus or the left pulmonary artery, as been published uh, from a group in uh, Dallas, Texas, suggests that the ductus is probably not going to close. I guess, again, of course, if you're talking about the first day or two of life, that's really not an issue of value. But that's some example of size because I think uh, 
you know, it's, uh, it's, uh, we, we've had this tendency uh, in, in uh, adult medicine to always say that there's an absolute on size because most adults are the same size. But the, the difference in size and body surface area between a, a 800 gram infant and a 3 kilogram infant is really substantial. So we have to have uh, measures that we can do to look at the, start, the size of the ductus. Now we also use uh, this uh, PISA. This is not the town down south, but stands for proximal eyes of velocity surface acceleration. And I'll show you some examples of how that can be of value to you in looking at the size of the ductus. Blood pressure. I think uh, if it's taken properly, you get some idea of the measurement of abnormality. And uh, in where I grew up uh, with uh, uh, Bill Tooley and Rod Fibbs, and George Gregory, uh, a greater than 30 millimeter pulse pressure was considered significant for a patent ductus. I think a lot of all of these things have sort of started to become murked by the fact that we're dealing with infants now uh, that are so small sometimes that uh, these issues are really not that valuable because uh, you can deal with a, an 800 gram who's got a blood pressure of, uh, of uh, 70 or 60 systolic and that's fairly normal and a 30 millimeter pulse pressure there is really tremendous. So a lot of these things are really not that valuable. But I think looking at retrograde flow in the abdominal aorta has become a standard uh, which I actually learned uh, from uh, one of our colleagues Dr. Fred Bierman uh, when we uh, were uh, giving a course like this uh, at Heart House many years ago that uh, looking at uh, how the blood flow goes in the abdominal aorta gives you an excellent idea of uh, the runoff from the systemic to the pulmonary circulation. And uh, so uh, if it's uh, prograde, that's normal. If it's uh, flat, that's mildly abnormal. If it's retrograde and it's small, that's usually a sign of a moderate ductus. And if there's a lot of runoff, it's, it's high. And in fact, when you have massive runoff, you can get a velocity time integral, the integral of the size of the signal that's almost equivalent to the prograde flow, suggesting very little flow going to the abdominal aorta and the body, uh, the organs in the, in, the, in the lower body, and of course all the problems that you get with uh, necrotizing enterocolitis, etc., and renal uh, output become uh, uh, more uh, significant under that circumstance. And then we look at the velocity of flow in the ductus. And, uh, of course, that uh, varies depending upon the differences between the, hemat uh, between the pulmonary and the systemic circulation. But the, when the ductus starts to constrict uh, and um, the pressure in the pulmonary artery falls, then the flow velocity changes. And I think uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, we've uh, turned this into five, and we're trying to work on something like an APGAS score. So you give a patient two points if they've got no retrograde flow. You give them uh, two points if they've got uh, a restrictive ductus or no Doppler signal for, uh, across the ductus. We look at the PISA, we give them if they've got uh, an, no uh, velocity acceleration across there, we give them zero points. And so we get a score that's like an APGAR score and we're working on that um, to see if we can quantitate um, on a sort of an objective basis uh, what the size of the ductus uh, might be in terms of its predictor value and working with a group of uh, very skeptical neonatologists I think um, um, will, uh, if we can come up with something valuable is going to be important. And then we looked at the signs of the uh, magnitude of the uh, flow. Dr. Sanders yesterday <coughs> talked about uh, patent, uh, uh, about ventricular septal defects and how this loads the left circulation and the right. Now the, part, the ductus circulation is uh, even more specific for the left side of the heart because um, the, um, the flow actually uh, that you calculate on Doppler is quite interesting because the blood flow that comes out of the aorta is the, um, uh, is the um, really basically the pulmonary blood flow and the blood that comes out the right ventricular outflow tract is really the systemic blood flow. It's very interesting to think of it in those terms but um, you can do Doppler studies and work on that. Why do I say the pulmonary flow is the systemic flow? Because the aortic flow is the systemic flow plus the left to right shunt. And if it's isolated from the ductus, that's almost always um, uh, the problem. The, the other issue uh, that uh, we learned at medical school 
is that with the first, second, or third breath, the foramen ovale closes. And we all know now that there's, that's uh, nothing further from the truth than the fact that the foramen is a functionally uh, effective organ uh, in the first couple of days of life. And so there's often left to right shunting that can occur at that level that complicates and, uh, um, uh, the whole issue of making an assessment of shunt flow. So here's PISA. It stands for Proximal Isovelocity Surface Acceleration. And it's based on the fact that um, what, uh, when you're looking in a jet over here with the, any kind of signal, the velocities are so high and difficult to evaluate that you land up getting aliasing. And you can't really tell anything about the aliasing here. But we know um, if you look at, um, at this, let's say this is a soccer game. I'm in Europe, so I'll call it a soccer game. And this is the turnstile where the people are coming in to the uh, stadium and they come through a, a place where they present their tickets. Now you see the people, they all stand in a line waiting to get in and the line and the crowd get smaller and smaller and as they move in this direction the, they get faster and faster. Now if you look at how they accelerate, they accelerate towards this opening here uh, in a, a, along what we call an isovelocity plot. So the people at the back are moving very slowly and as they get closer and closer to the stadium they, they move and when they come through their gate they're traveling at, at, at a, a, a different rate. So we know the formula for this, that this is really a hemisphere which has an area, and the area of that is 2 pi r squared, I mentioned that yesterday, times the Nyquist limit, and that's the level where the aliasing occurs. See, we know that red blood flow, uh, in Doppler terms, is going towards the transducer, and blue is going away from the transducer. And as the blood or the people accelerate here, they reach a point where they're traveling at 55 centimeters per second. And that 55 centimeters per second, which is the Nyquist limit, is also the, this area. Now, we know that all the blood cells are traveling at this rate. Now, if this was an ideal circumstance, we could turn this into something that looks like this. <coughs> this is what it would look like if you were standing at the back of this uh, ductus and looking at it. It would look like a, a sphere with increasing velocities if you could look through it. And at that point, we... we we get what they call the boundary of the first alias. And then the blood starts to travel faster, and it actually looks like it's going backwards, but it's actually accelerating, as I showed yesterday, as the, instead of looking this as a bar, if you look at it as a circle, it goes round and round and gets faster and faster. So at this point here, we have a radius. And the radius uh, is measured in, uh, in centimeters. And, uh, uh, and of course, it comes in the 2 pi r squared, and you get a number times the Nyquist limit and uh, multiply that um, by a mean velocity because it's an average and you can get a velocity in mils per minute of the size of the PISA. There are many problems with uh, looking at uh, PISA from this point of view but it's really quite useful and here is one of the problems you see that it, although there's continuous uh, flow coming in that it seems to change throughout the cardiac cycle. So one measurement may not be accurate, and also for this to work, it has to be a perfectly spherical hole, which it may not be. And uh, certainly when we get to um, look at color flow with three-dimensional imaging, we may have a much better assessment of the, uh, the area, because the area will change depending upon what the orifice size looks like. <coughs> so here's a big duct, okay, and we're looking at flow in this big duct over here, and you can see actually there's almost no acceleration. You can see how large the ductus is over here, um, and this is obviously a small neonate, and we've got nearly a centimetre. This is probably taken early on in life, and we're looking at the abdominal aorta here, uh, and we look at the abdominal aorta from the subcostal or the subxiphoid view, and we try and get the 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 aorta running in a vertical direction because Doppler is best assessed when the flow velocity is vertical. And the way to do that is to take the probe, and I have a lot of trouble with, in America with technologists who just put the probe down, get the descending aorta and put the signal in the <coughs> descending aorta, and they wonder why they're not getting a good look at the signal. And the answer is that they're coming too high up, 
It's better to come down a little bit, get underneath the liver, and then angle cra cranially. And as you move the transducer cranially, the aorta, instead of running in a horizontal direction, tends to run in a more vertical direction. And then, of course, the Doppler is more accurate. Now, one of the techniques that I found useful uh, in, in producing the signal is when you um, use color flow and you can see the flow velocity, that's the place you should put the Doppler signal because color is really pulse Doppler in color. Color Doppler is really just a pulse Doppler technique in color. So if you want to see a particular area with a pulse Doppler, then if you put the Doppler <coughs> signal in the place where you can see the color, you're going to get a signal. It sounds very simple, but it seems to have eluded a lot of my colleagues uh, in the United States. And then you can see here prograde flow coming down the descending aorta. Look at this beautiful angle. We've got almost a vertical uh, orientation of the um, aorta on the reference image here. You see prograde flow in systole. And then you see this usual uh, kick from the, uh, the um, elastic uh, character of the whole uh, thoracoabdominal aortic system. And then you see at the end of diastole that there is also still some um, uh, retrograde flow. The flow is going back towards the aorta and it's running uh, into the pulmonary artery. And here, if you Doppler in this region, you get a signal that looks like this. And you can see here in the ductus, there's actually with the pulmonary ejection, a little right to left shunt and then a large left to right shunt uh, at ductus level. So that tells you already that on, on these three things that you're dealing with a big ductus. Uh, let's have a look at some real images. Now here is a, an example of a ductus that is already starting to constrict. And interestingly enough, it looks like, uh, you know, we, we know that ductuses usually constrict on the pulmonary end. But the, actually there are three places that the ductus can start constricting. It can start constricting on the pulmonary end, it can constrict in the middle, and it can constrict on the aortic end. And I don't know if these ductuses don't obey any specific rules. It's most likely that it starts on the pulmonary end. And when it starts like that, you can see that there is a um, continuous left to right shunt with the color part of the image here. Uh, let me just uh, stop this for a minute. And if we look at the color signal, we'll watch with the electrocardiogram. So we start with the QRS complex here. And you can see that there's flow throughout the cardiac cycle in the left to right direction. Huh? And you see how it changes. And here's the PZ at the end. Well, here's the radius here. The radius is about uh, a half a centimeter. Uh, so uh, then we'll apply that in the Nyquist limit, multiply by 60, and have an example of the exact left to right shunt volume. And here's an example of a ductus that's not constricted. I'll try and play both of those together for you. Let me see whether I can do this. Yeah, and you can see the difference here between the ductus and um, the, um, the, um, that's starting to constrict and one that's got no evidence of constriction at all. And let me just tell you about this view. This view was actually called by Dr. Jeff Smallhorn the ductus cut. And I like to tell um, all of my uh, technologists and colleagues that the ductus cut is really a high parasternal cut taken in an almost cranial caudal direction. In fact, it's the ductus arch that we're trying to look at. And people try from the suprasternal notch where it isn't, and they try it parasternally from low where it isn't. It's a high image. And the secret of getting the image well is here's an example is you look for the vertebral bodies. You know, the descending aorta is running very close to the vertebral body. So if you align the vertical bodies along the direction of the ductus, then you can get this view. And it's a beautiful view for looking at the isthmus of the aorta, the left subclavian, the descending aorta, and the duct. Uh, we have a special code for that, and um, so every patient will get this as part of the evaluation of the ductus. Okay, here's a small duct. Let's look at the PISA here. Well, where's the PISA? Here it is. There's just a little aliasing in this direction here. And we also look at this area here, which is in jet physics called the vena contractor. That's if you take a garden hose pipe. I don't know whether any of you have gardens, 
But if you take a, a hose pipe and you put it on so that it goes far, you're making a jet. The, 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 the velocity of the water comes towards the narrowest point. That's called um, the uh, area of uh, proximal isoconvergence. And that's the narrowest point of the jet. It's called the vena contractor in physics terms. Right there. Okay, and that's also another measure of ductus size because it's going down to almost nothing. I mean, that's a very nice issue. Now, yesterday, Dr. Asbani said she likes to do surface echoes. I find often when you have kids on the ventilator, you lose a lot of the precordial images. And the best place to actually do this is to do this in the, um, in, from the abdomen. Because the central tendon of the diaphragm excludes the lungs from encroaching. So if you come uh, trans uh, abdominally, subsiphoid or subcostally as I like to call it, uh, you can get a nice picture. And here in the bottom frame is a subcostal image. And uh, we're looking at, this is posterior and anterior. Here's the diaphragm, the surface of the diaphragm, which I've cut off in this picture. And here you can see, you can almost see the descending aorta in many of these. And you see here comes the ductus. Uh, and you can see the area where it's narrowest. It's a very narrow ductus. Because there's a large pressure drop between the left and the right ventricles, uh, you can get a lot of force in this jet. Yeah, and it goes all the way down to the pulmonary artery and actually bounces off the pulmonary valve. Okay, here we've got even smaller ducts. And there's a two-dimensional image and you really almost can't see the ductus there. Here's the ductus right here. And the color is a useful guide as to the ductus size. So there's the ductus there and there's an, another tiny ductus. Uh, those are course, so we're looking at Pisa here looking at that. And here's just an example uh, in um, a normal neonate of the ductus closure, which is, although incomplete uh, com uh, in its total sense, is complete because it's totally constricted at the ductus end. And it makes this little arch here, which sometimes is very large and can be confused with coarctation of the aorta. When you have coarctation, the shelf is usually posterior, not anterior like this. And this is what we call the ductus beak, this is the aortic ampulla end of the ductus arteriosus. Okay, and un this is a, just an example of failed ductuses. In the old days, everybody went and got a thoracotomy and got surgery for this. And uh, it used to be done by using a ligatures, and ligatures sometimes slip. Today, most surgeons are using staples, which tend not to slip. But here's an example of a ductus which uh, was uh, closed, but not quite, not all the way. Okay, so that, uh, that's one example. And this is another example of what you can get into trouble and you have to suspect when you're dealing with this. This is a baby that had signs of a patent ductus, okay, and got a ductus ligation. Uh, that's what the surgeon said. And you can see that there's a ductus ligation because there is the clip. But you notice also that there's a whiteout of the left lung here. And it's very difficult for inexperienced surgeons. This is not a job for inexperienced surgeons, by the way. But when you go into ligated ductus, when you go in through the left thorax, a lot of people will mistake, neo, no, neophyte surgeons will mistake which is the ductus. The ductus is often the biggest structure that they see. And they want to ligate the smaller structure, which is either the aortic isthmus or the left pulmonary artery. And this surgeon couldn't even tell that he was looking at a vascular structure, and he put the clip on the left bronchus, and so he got a left white out of the lung, but with a large ductus. So, and here it is. You can see the clip there, but it's not on the ductus. The ductus is still wide open. So even in the great wide open country of the United States, uh, from San Francisco, uh, the home of uh, patent ductus arteriosus uh, physiology and um, management, uh, you get surgeons that, uh, although they're experienced to some extent, manage to ligate the wrong thing. So we brought this child to our hospital, we um, closed the ductus, put a clip on the ductus, took the clip off the bronchus, had to do a bronchogram to open the, 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 uh, the left bronchus, and the patient did well. So how else do we look at uh, size of a ductus? And we look at it from the, from the hemodynamics that we see on the left ventricle. When you have a big ductus, the left side of the heart is contracting well. 
And so the diameters of the aorta, and we can look at this with z-scores today, we can see whether it's big or not. Okay? We can look at the LA-AO ratio. Um, uh, it's usually done uh, in systole, uh, in the way I described it, was you take a systolic measurement of the root and the left atrial size as a measurement of the flow. The root acts as the normal and you get a ratio. In the normal child, it's about 0.67 to about 0.9. And a ductus that's significant has a ratio of greater than 1.3 to 1. And in a recent survey that I saw published, it's still the number one uh, evaluation of, uh, of uh, ductus, uh, significant ductus arteriosus. So it's very easy to do, and uh, you don't need to do an M mode anymore. You can do it just straightly off a, a, an image here, like a reference image. And you can see that the aorta is larger. The problem with uh, doing these measurements not on an M mode is that your frame rate and the point where you can make these measurements is not as accurate as you can here because this is a cycle that has 2,000 fr uh, frames per second and this one has 30 frames per second. So the chances of you actually getting to actual end systole or end diastole are not so great. Is there anybody here that still uses M mode? Ah, oh, I love you all. Thank you. So now here's a big ductus. Once again, uh, almost no PISA. You see that? You just see acceleration in the ductus. No PISA at all. And you can see the flow velocity here uh, proximal, proximally. What happens is blood is rushing towards the ductus in diastole. It's not only stealing from the lower body, it's also stealing from the upper body. So the hemodynamics of a big ductus suggests that uh, there's something coming out of the arm vessels and maybe even the brain. Okay, and so you see prograde flow in diastole here above the ductus, and if you come down below the ductus, you see retrograde flow. So if you get an arch and you can get it in an alignment with the ductus, you can actually pinpoint the area of the ductus from just looking at the pulse doppler and seeing where the signal changes from this to that or from that to this. Very easy. Okay, I'll put on some labels just in case. Um, I don't think it's necessary for this audience. Okay, and then we look at the abdominal aorta, and here I've got uh, the so-called haberdasher's approach. Here's a normal signal. Now, there's normally prograde diastolic flow in the abdominal aorta. The angle here is, uh, is, is less wonderful than I would think, and I would suggest that you stay at the level of the diaphragm or below to get a good signal. The one thing that you don't want to do as a neonatologist is you do not want to get into the superior mesenteric or the celiac artery because the hemodynamics and vascular resistance of that system is so great that you're going to make all kinds of errors about the assessment by using uh, the superior mesenteric or the celiac. So you must stay in the abdominal aorta and you must get the best alignment possible. So if this is normal, here is a mild abnormality. Look, there really isn't a whole lot of anything happening in diastole. And let me just say one other thing to you as neonatologists over here and cardiologists when you do this signal. You know, uh, the way we set up a Doppler signal to get a lovely signal is we put on what they call the wall filter. The wall filter takes the first 50 or 100 milli, uh, um, uh, 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 millimeters of signal and it blanks it out so that you shouldn't see anything. And then you get an overdamped signal in the aorta and you can't recognize the subtle changes that occur there. So there's a thing on all of your echo machines called wall filter. And you have to turn that down because what you're looking at is not what's happening in, in the big part of the cycle but what happens at the lowest velocity that tells you. So always remember wall filter is very important. And you must be able to see some noise in the signal here. Look, here's one complex that looks like it's got prograde flow. Here's two with absence. And then you start to see this, where as we get uh, moderate size ductus, you see there's retrograde flow. This is the one that's going to have an abnormal blood pressure, the one that will have pu pu pulsatile palms and so on and so forth. Um, and and then you get uh, more significant stuff with continuous retrograde flow, and it can get much larger than this. But those are what I would consider large ductuses. Okay, so, and you can use this for anything. You see this with a, a BT shunt, uh, for example. And we know 
what velocities can be from hemodynamics on a BT shunt, you'll see a two to one or a three to one shunt that will look like this. So that's another idea of assessing the size and importance of the ductus. Then we Doppler in the ductus and we have the haberdashers approach again from a tiny ductus where there's continuous flow. And here, look, there is only a mean pressure difference of about uh, 16 to 20 millimeters of mercury between the pulmonary artery and the aorta. But when you're dealing with a baby whose systolic pressure is 60, suggest the pulmonary artery uh, systolic pressure is only uh, 40. Not too bad, okay? Not perfect, but not too bad. And then this signal starts to diminish in size, and we, we've arranged the point system for this. And when the ductus starts to get large, you start to see the fall off in diastole of the signal, okay? And uh, of course, look, I've changed the scales here. You see, that's three meters per second. This is only 1.5. So this is a much smaller signal, and it starts to get retrograde flow. And here you see in the ductus, you see uh, that in systole there's a right to left shunt, and in diastole there's a left to right shunt. So, and this patient is probably on a ventilator as well, because you can see how the ECG has been affected by the oscillating ventilator that's gone on, on the ECG. This is not atrial flutter. Okay, and so here's an example of a small ductus with continuous wave and a large ductus by pulse wave. Okay. And here's the color Doppler assessment, and I've told you we've done this actually before. Here's a big duct, here's a medium-sized duct, and here's a small duct. Now, the radius is not as described over here. It's half of that. It's about uh, 2.8, because here's the, you can see very beautifully on this signal here. Do you see how the signal changes from red to yellow? At yellow, that point is about 64 centimeters per second. We know that. That's how you can use it to calculate the PISA. So you can see here a variety of, of ductus sizes. And then we're looking also to see here there is no uh, vena contractor. Here's a small vena contractor. And here's a tiny vena contractor. So we've got a really good handle on size. We can also look at the size of the, uh, of the left pulmonary artery, uh, the ductus to the left pulmonary artery. And this is small over here and so on and so forth. So we've got a lot of signals that, and, and ways to assess ductus size. Okay, now, I mean, the one thing about the ductus is sometimes it's not so bad to have a ductus. Okay, and we've seen this many times. Child comes in with a co-optation, neonatology, jerk, knee-jerk reaction, give in the methods and the pulses disappear in the lower body. Okay, because the child's got a ductus too. So we have to look at other structures in terms of the ductus and look what's going on. Uh, the ductus position and orientation changes depending upon what's happening in fetal life. Uh, here's a transposition, and the flow is going from the pulmonary artery to the descending aorta in normal uh, direction here, in uterine life. And so the ductus is big and is directly oriented in the direction of flow. Here's a patient with pulmonary atresia over here. And you see here, the flow is no flow coming into the pulmonary artery. Here's the main pulmonary artery. And you see the ductus is vertically oriented here, okay? Because in fetal life, the blood was coming immediately into the ductus arteriosus. So looking at the, where the ductus uh, uh, size and uh, position is will also tell you something about the fetal hemodynamics. Here's a coarctation of the aorta. Very beautiful. This one is a probably what we call a pre-ductal co-octation, because here's the ductus, and the co-octation is occurring in the aortic isthmus proximal to the, the co over here. And here's the picture, and you can see here how there's also some narrowing that occurs, and how endomethacin and other structures here uh, can temporize um, the hemodynamics, because although... Um, there is uh, some uh, ductus constriction. There's still the opportunity for blood to use this as a sort of a bypass, and that's how endomethacin works. We also know from the work of Git uh, Gittenberger de Groot that the ductus musculature in a co actually strings around the back of, um, of the, um, the, the arterial duct. Now, not all ductuses are bad. Here's a patient who's got bilateral ductuses without central pulmonary arteries. Uh, and you can see the angiogram, and we know that there are two arterial ducts in fetal life. 
So this is a patient with pulmonary atresia and bilateral ductuses. Uh, the arch is actually a right aortic arch, and that's something that you have to remember when you look for the ductus, is you have to orient where the aortic arch is, because the ductus comes from the base of the left or the right arch or both. Okay? So here's the right ductus from a right arch, and here is the left ductus from a left arch. And if you didn't believe me, here's an angiogram to prove it. There are two pulmonary arteries and no central pulmonary artery, and this is what it looks like on echocardiogram when you look at it with real time. There's the right arch with the left innominate artery here, and there's the ductus coming off here. And the top picture shows the whole right aortic arch with a right ductus coming off the base of the aortic arch. So bilateral ducts, and I think I even have an angiogram, yes. Okay, this is an old-fashioned technique that's uh, not used much anymore. Um, uh, and uh, you, here's an angiogram done uh, from the pulmonary artery in, in, in this child with pulmonary atresia. And you can see uh, very beautifully in this example the bilateral nature of the ductus is from this very patient I've shown you um, and um, the fact that there is no uh, central main pulmonary artery, which is typically how these ductuses persist, and tells you something about the embryological development of uh, these conditions. Okay, so we get right ducts off the left arch and left ducts off the right arch. Um, and you can see um, uh, the pulmonary artery here in the wrong uh, uh, direction. It almost looks like a, the situs inversus. There's the right ductus there. You see, we've oriented this in a way I like to do this, to turn the probe as if we're looking at a coronal plane image and see the ductus. And here's another one. Now, uh, not only, I mean, the ductus has uh, sort of started to be uh, not much of an issue, um, but there are a number of other important things that occur with the ductus that are just beyond the uh, recognition uh, in uh, in, uh, for neonatologists that are important for us, and I'll, I'll get into a few of them, but that example of the ductuses over there is, of course, very important. And one of the other things that we've noticed from our, our work in, in the neonate, uh, in the fetus, is this presence of ductus aneurysm. And that's been a worry. Dr. Lisa Hornberg has written a number of uh, uh, papers about this. We've seen this. They generally go away within the first 12 to 24 hours after birth. Um, the ductus has still got muscle in it, it's aneurysmal. You can see the ductus over here now. There's a big aneurysm of the ductus, much more impressive in neonatal life. And you have to do your echoes really quickly because there's the ductus, and then you see the aneurysm down below here as well. And within a few days of life, this usually constricts off and leads to no problems. The patients in whom it does become a problem are patients particularly with the uh, connective tissue disorders in the Marfan's group and uh, the ellis Danlos group where they can become very large and they become a surgical issue. And once again, I think that you have to realize that when you look at them, that, um, that um, over the course of, of time that the surgery for these particular kinds of ductuses is something only for a very experienced cardiovascular surgeon. <coughs> You don't want your general surgeon dealing with this. And here you see the aneurysm here, and this is a subcostal coronal cut. But when you look at the flow velocity, it's almost completely closed. And over a period of time, this uh, generally tends to resolve. You see it there with uh, well thrombosed. And then they look like that. So we do follow them, and they don't turn out to be big problems, but we see that. Now, lastly, <coughs> The, um, the issue um, of uh, the ductus has become uh, a totally different now with the fact that you can close them, not with cardiovascular surgery, but you can close them on a catheter. And I can tell you, having worked with the organization in America that is developing it, that the next development is going to be to be able to put a mini device in a very small umbilical catheter, five French catheter, and perhaps close some of these. That's coming down the pike. And I think that's going to change, uh, 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 again, our assessment of who needs surgery and when we're going to close ductuses and so on. Because if it can be closed easily and you can decrease morbidity, if you can keep a, a, a newborn 
out of the intensive care unit for uh, two, three days or a week, the savings financially for the country and the institutions, etc., is phenomenal, not to mention the fact that it may be good for the patients. Uh, I'm sorry to have put it in those terms, but I think that that's how people think about healthcare these days. The patient isn't the first thing on the list. So here's a patient who's going to have a device uh, closure, and I'll, t I'll tell you that uh, these pictures are pictures from Dr. Shirali's laboratory, and uh, one of the best laboratories in the United States. Um, I've looked at all of them, and here you see a ductus with PISA, with vena constructor, a small ductus that's not in a neonate, but this is the consequence. You see the beautiful funnel shape of the ductus arteriosus. Here's the PISA, there's the vena contractor. And then, uh, excuse me, Dr. Shirali has measured all of these things, the ductus length and so on. And so when we know these things, we know that we can put this in perspective for the interventionalists who we work with, that they can uh, help close these arterial ducts. And we measure the size of the pulmonary arteries because sometimes the pulmonary artery, the, 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 the device, will sit out in the, the pulmonary artery. You see this patient has also got a little pulmonary insufficiency, which is uh, not an uncommon finding and even less uh, surprising in the, the sense that it is found in, uh, in uh, uh, babies uh, uh, with, uh, with the patent ductus arteriosus. And here is the ductus device. You can see the top hat and the section over here. This is where the pin, where the wire is put in. It's usually put in from the pulmonary artery into the descending aorta and then withdrawn. And you can see how this is related to the left pulmonary artery. The, although it seems to be involved with the left pulmonary artery, I'll tell you something about the physics of the ultrasound, which is why it's important to know something about it, is that because of the strength of the signal, it often looks like it's right in the pulmonary artery where it's really only adjacent to the pulmonary artery. And we worry about that, but we have other ways of looking at it because you can see, although, here's the device, you see, it's uh, sitting, closing the ductus, but if you look at what's happened to the left pulmonary artery, the flow velocity in the right and the left pulmonary artery is different. There's some acceleration, so there is a little bit of narrowing that has occurred here, and, and this is in a child, it's going to get better with time, with the passage of time. And we want to measure, like with this continuous do uh, Doppler, this is the proximal velocity, and this is the distal velocity, and under these circumstances you have to use V2 minus V1 squared multiplied by 4. You can't disregard the proximal velocity in terms of assessing what the velocity of flow is. So then of course sometimes, and this is a caveat, I'm, I'm not going to get into this for Dr. Sanders, but when you see a ductus that's bigger than the aortic arch, then you have to worry that there's going to be a blockage between the aortic arch. And this is just such an example. There's the, the um, I'll just stop this for you. And we look at the, this, this clip here. There's the ascending aorta with the vessels to the head and neck coming off it. And then there's the color flow. And this is the left subclavian artery and this is the left carotid artery. So this is a type B aortic arch interruption from the suprasternal notch view. And I'll let it play for you one more time. Okay, that's the same picture. So caveat, when you see a big ductus, a giant ductus, what you're dealing with. Okay, the one thing also about these devices is that uh, in the world of reality, nothing is exactly perfect. And sometimes there are little leaks that occur. These will generally go away. This is not the ductus device, this is so what they call a Jean Turco coil, okay, here that's placed in this ductus. Here was a little ductus to start off with. Here's the coil with nothing in it, uh, apparently on angio, and yet on echo you can still see a little bit of flow coming across this ductus early on. So that's all I have to say about the ductus, and we've got time with the faculty here to have a, a little symposium and get your input on what else you think is important. Thank you for your attention. Get the last one. It's your time. No questions? Clear as mud? Oh, you have a question, yes, sir. Did you place for stents? Did you place for stents? Yes. 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 Did you place for stents
stents in the ductus. Uh, I guess there is a place for them. Uh, it depends what, uh, you know, um, for a tiny patient that needs this ductus uh, dependent, or for a patient uh, as a part of a hybrid procedure for a type 1 lowered, yes, there is a, an indication. It's a real problem, actually. Um, my institution doesn't actually use stents. Um, uh, we, we've had only done one uh, uh, hybrid procedure in our in our. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but yeah, there are a few occasions where it's necessary. Of course, in the aortic arch show uh, and in the hybrid procedure, we're going to be talking about. Now, I don't know whether you have any information on that, Steve, as part of your talk or Girish. Um. Right. So we actually do uh, quite a few hybrid procedures um, in, our, in our center. Any of you show me hands familiarity with the hybrid procedure? Anyone know about the hybrid? No. So the hybrid procedure is done when you um, when you've got uh, for some reason you're trying to stage people towards a part, you know, but if you have a single ventricle that is duct dependent and you're trying to stage them towards a, a part end. Um, the standard approach was that the first operation for those children would be to either uh, put in a, a, a shunt to replace the duct uh, or to do a normal procedure uh, with the shunt. Uh, especially the normal procedure has a lot of uh, morbidity, mortality. And so in, uh, in, even in our center where the results are quite poor with the regular normal, there are still some babies where the, there are other problems that make them high risk. Uh, so they may be premature, they may have some kidney issues or something like that, and the family still wants everything done. Um, and in those, what we do is we, uh, we go in and do a hybrid where we are combining a catheter approach with a surgical approach. <coughs> so the whole procedure is done uh, in a cat lab that has been converted into an operating room. And uh, the surgeon basically goes in from the front of the chest and uh, through the main pulmonary artery, makes a hole in the main pulmonary artery, and then puts in a sheet through that and goes into the PDA. Mm -hmm. And then, well, the, the, this is where it's called a hybrid, so it's a combined approach. So the surgeon and the interventionist together will do this, and they'll step the PDA. And then the other thing that they will do is that they will band the pulmonary artery. So you see there's your individual. So there's a band on the right pulmonary artery and a band on the left pulmonary artery. The big advantage of doing this is that um, uh, instead of a, a high risk, big operation, you end up with a, with a much uh, inferior, smaller, smaller procedure. Uh, and the risk is that you know what you're really doing is uh, you're basically um, uh, you know, it's like a, um, you're, you're delaying the problem, you're delaying the problem. So what happens is that the second operation, which usually, if you do a normal, then the second operation is usually a, a, a blend, which is a straightforward operation. So after a usual straightforward blend, most babies will go home within several days or a week or something like that. Um, but if you go for the hybrid, then when they go in for the blend, they have to take off the right body artery band, take off the left body artery band, remove the stem from inside the PDA. So they have to do the normal and the blend in the same One big, very, very long <coughs> operation. Yeah. So that's the reason why some centers, you know, some so Dr. Silverman Center, for example, is, is not, does not believe in the, in the hybrid. I guess so they've only done one. Um, <laughs> we, 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 we do the hybrid, um, uh, but we do it only in the highest patients. As you might guess, the results are not that great when you only do a procedure in the highest patients. So. Well, I, mean, I think that, the, what do you do in your hospital? Yeah, so, um, we have a, a, a different approach. We have a surgeon that's pushing the hybrid operation, actually. And so, uh, we've done a lot of hybrids and we offer it as a standard approach. And there is no difference, as far as we can tell, up to now, in mortality and uh, out in initial outcomes. 
Uh, there's maybe a small difference in the amount of time in the ICU uh, initially, that makes sense. It's a theoretically small operation. Uh, and while the hybrid was first re, you know, brought in again, it's an old, it's an old idea, it was from Bill Norwood uh, originally, I think we had the idea, but it wasn't uh, popularized. Now that it's come in again, um, initially it was brought in to decrease morbidity and mortality, but we haven't found that. We haven't found any advantage in our initial experience. So we are now randomizing babies who have hyper or hyperplastic heart syndrome, they're being randomized. And uh, in a trial, in a, in a prospective clinical trial, and the and the outcome is not morbidity or mortality, although obviously those will be evaluated. It's neurodevelopmental outcomes uh, at two years. The theory being, and, and here the neonatologist can talk better than I can. Um, the theory being that if you not putting a young baby with an immature brain and some of the literature around PBL and perinatalasia, etc. If you're not putting them on bypass at a week of age, but deferring that to four to six months of age, and we'll defer, we'll push it further, if you know, to the six month age if possible, um, then you may be, uh, you may have less uh, brain damage or better neurodevelopmental outcomes. I can tell you that, um, and here is now my anecdotal or my own personal bias or view, is that I, I don't see a, a, a big advantage uh, to the hybrid versus the Norwood. I see babies that struggle after the hybrid in the ICU. I see babies that struggle after the Norwood and vice versa. Last week, a uh, patient of mine underwent the hybrid and, and has done fantastic fetal diagnosis. The parents chose the hybrid. In other words, he wasn't randomized. The parents want that approach to go into the trial. And, but I've had patients who have uh, had the opposite outcome. So I think it's, a, it's an open question. What we do do in Toronto that's different than other centres, so um, Columbus, Ohio, we, you know, pioneered a lot of the hybrid, but what Chris Calderon, who's the surgeon in Toronto, pioneered is what's called the reverse BT shunt. So you just had a talk on the duct, and in the hybrid, you put a large stent through the duct into the descending aorta. But if you have a very narrow isthmus and you don't have antibody flow from the Aorta, if you have very little antigrade flow, there's a concern that you're going to block the retrograde flow from the descending aorta back into the brain. So in some cases, depending on the anatomy, we'll actually put in a, a BT shunt, but it will function as a reverse BT shunt, so from the palmary circulation into the brain. You know, so the hybrid recreates a fetal physiology in a sense. You're keeping the duct open and you're elevating the palmary vascular resistance. And here we, I guess, creating another duct, if you will, for a reserve mm -hmm. shot. You, you need a macro rebuttal to you. Um, my surgeons believe that uh, for mediocre surgery, the hybrid approach is good. Um, our survival for the normal procedure is about 95%. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think there are many people uh, that have that kind of survival. The, the problem with the hybrid is, number one, you can't do it if you have a co-optation. Because if there's a co-optation, then you get uh, into the problem that uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Friedberg has just mentioned. The, the, so when there's a, a, a co-optation, that's a really almost a contraindication to doing a hybrid procedure. The fact that you put a stent in a structure is damages that structure. And if you leave it for a long period of time, you have to take it out. And the uh, removal of that is a complicated issue. Because you damage the underlying vessel, you may actually have to, have to use a home block to reconstruct the vessel, and so on and so forth. And um, <coughs> the, 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 the Nord is unquestionably a big operation, it's a bad operation, um, it may be the best thing that we've got. But the thing about the second and third stages in our institution is that the glen can be done off pump, and the extra cardiac uh, uh, fontaine is done off pump as well. So the patient instead of seeing um, um, two or three um, uh, pump and cardiovascular support, we only get it once during the normal procedure. The issue about the brain development has become one of the talking points in terms of, um, of uh, the issue of fetal physiology. And it is clear that there are a number of issues involved with the perfusion of the brain in the fetus with hyperplastic left 
that are a problem. And so that many of the problems that you think that you face <coughs> that may previously be considered to be related to um, the, uh, the normal procedure or perfusion are not really related to the normal pr procedure, but are related to the actual uh, hemodynamic compromises that occur because of the circulation in the norwood, particularly if there's a co-optation, a pre-ductal co-optation that develops. So, I mean, this is a murky issue, and we're trying to talk about stents in the ductal for you. And we've gone into an argument uh, that we're going to be talking about in our hyperplastic left heart. So I'd like to but maybe you, stop this now and carry on talking about it. But then you press with the last word. That's right. Who asked the question? Yeah, this gentleman from America. Okay, so, so that's why you shouldn't ask these questions. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> if you ask the question, you've got three different answers. You see, there's, no consensus, there's no consensus on this issue. Yeah. There's clearly just no consensus. So um, I have the last word with my wife for four years here. Yes. So um, I think let's call it a day on that. We'll talk about that later. It's late. Uh, on time and we're going to talk about uh, well, I wanted to, to I think PDA is probably an important topic to maybe discuss just a little bit longer I think not just in the neonate but I, which we can discuss as well but I think afterwards there's a huge at least in the United States there's a huge issue of what to do with the PDA um, that is a silent PDA so a PDA that you found incidentally because the patient had a murmur you did an echo on them and then you found a PDA. Or even they didn't have a murmur, they came in with an abnormal EKG and you got an echo, or whatever the reason was that you got an echo and you found a PDA. And um, sometimes even if the murmur was a PDA, the question is, the child is thriving, they're growing well, they're doing well, do you close the PDA, do you not close the PDA? And I think that's a conversation, I think that's important to sort of Discuss. I think it's different at different um, institutions. I think it used to be uh, much more done that for a while when surgery was the only option. It was, you know, they left it alone and then the patients would get SBE um, prophylaxis. And then now that intervention cardiac catheterization is available, more patients got closed. And now it's the pendulum is swinging back the other way of maybe we don't need to do anything for these patients. And so I think. It's important to have a little bit of that conversation, I think, especially for patients, for some of you who are pediatricians, who may find these patients in your um, practice, and what do you do for them? And I don't know what's done across the world for these patients, but um, I know in the United States, many of them do end up going to the cath lab and having it closed. Um, Dr. Sanders, what's done at Boston, usually, with these patients with the silent PDA or a very small PDA with a child that's growing and thriving? It depends in part on who the cardiologist is. <laughs> I would say that people in the cath lab would be happy to close ductuses, even the ones they have to dilate to put anything in. To <laughs> but I think many of us think that's a little over the top and would not send a patient for that kind of so if the child is driving <coughs> you... If I can't hear it, I don't close it. <laughs> Same thing, you're yeah, nodding. But, yeah. So that's the approach I learned and that I keep on doing. If I can hear it, I send to the cat lab. Mm -hmm. If I don't hear it, I explain to the family the, the, the risks of endocarditis, which are very All difficult right, to quantify and very, right. very low. And that's, yeah. All right. Actually, there is a sort of endocarditis that we all quote as figures were done by in Toronto. They were done by Carl and Shaw, who must be close on 100 years of age now. And uh, they were done in the pre-antibiotic era. Right, so what do you quote? So I think that uh, the risk for endocarditis um, are substantially lower. And if you look at the American Heart Association recommendations for prophylaxis for infective endocarditis, there is no information on giving endocarditis prophylaxis to a silent ductus or even a ductus. Well, the new guideline, the new meaning, uh, 2007 or yeah. so, guidelines, uh, ductus is not an indication right. for uh, SBE or infective endocarditis prophylaxis. It's 
such bestie or nice guy dance in the UK, they are not um, encouraged to give any antibiotic prophylaxis. For right, them. and I think it's most of us now don't and follow also that. Also, the evidence from neurodevelopment outcome that whether you treat drug or whether you don't treat drug, the neurodevelopment <coughs> outcome does not keep up. Long and you're talking about in the preterm or in the preterm? The preterm. Pre yeah. The, the PGA is not an independent risk factor for neurodevelopmental poor outcome. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think. I mentioned this in my talk. Oh. Okay. I see. All right. Well, um, there was a great article out of Stanford that <coughs> discussed some of the um, improvements or lack thereof of PDAs. Uh, tetralogy, right? As we start to, to talk about tetralogy, I would just like to make one little point about <clears throat> the, uh, the ductus and where it actually comes from. It's important to keep in mind that the ductus that is on the same side as the aortic arch comes from the, the inner curvature of the arch and is generally the last vessel after the brachiocephalic vessels. Whereas a ductus that's on the opposite side of the aortic arch arises from the base of the innominate artery. So it's important to, to understand where the ductus comes from. The one on the same side as the arch comes from under the arch, whereas the one on the opposite side comes from the base of the innominate artery, usually associated with the subclavian. That's a, <clears throat> the vast majority of the time, that's uh, the, the, where the ductus will come from under those circumstances. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about Tetralogy of Fallot and <clears throat> continuing on in the same idea of trying to provide some kind of verbal definition of what we're talking about. This is again from the surgical publications uh, involved with the nomenclature project for um, various defects. And this is the definition that they would propose and, and I think it's quite correct and quite a useful definition because what it points out is that the primary abnormality really is the displacement, the abnormal position of the infundibular septum. Uh, this really is the, the primary problem in Tetralogy of Fallot. The infundibular septum <clears throat> is superior, anterior, and leftward compared to where it normally is. Uh, we'll see that it uh, that, that it joins the superior and leftward limb uh, of the septal band rather than into the Y of septal band, and this causes narrowing of the outflow tract. It allows for a large malalignment type of ventricular septal defect within the Y of septal band because the infundibular septum isn't there plugging the hole. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, varying degrees of aortic override because the infundibular septum is the outflow septum. It's the muscle bundle between the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So if it's displaced over the right ventricle, the aorta tends to come with it. And so the aorta overrides the septum even more than usual. And then the hypertrophy, of course, of the right ventricle is a secondary issue because the right ventricle is exposed to systemic pressure. So <clears throat> again, the physiology looks like this. Uh, we have right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, uh, sometimes at multiple levels, at the infundibular level because of the infundibular septal displacement, often at the valve level because the valve is abnormal and plastic many times in Tetralogy of Fallot, and often uh, at the arterial level, the 
pulmonary trunk and branch mm -hmm. pulmonary arteries may be smaller than normal uh, mm -hmm. in patients with tetralogy fallot. So there may be multiple levels of obstruction. What that results in is <clears throat> shunting from the right mm -hmm. ventricle directly into the aorta across the ventricular septal defect because uh, the aorta overrides the interventricular septum to some extent and so there can be direct injection of blood from the right ventricle as well as from the left uh, into the aorta. So typically one sees mixing of blood in the ascending aorta. Uh, you may see some mixing uh, uh, depending on where you sample exactly in the left ventricle but functionally what we see is it is uh, ejection of blood from both ventricles into the aorta and mixing primarily in the aorta. There may be mixing at atrial level as well depending on uh, whether there is an intact septum or an ASD or foramen or whatnot. And that can be um, either direction. It can be left to right, uh, uh, often because the, the left heart filling pressures are a little bit higher than the right. can be right to left if the right ventricle is very hypertrophied and the, the um, um, compliance of the right ventricle and right atrium may be a little worse uh, than the left side. It, it's, it's somewhat variable. Um, <clears throat> and there's RV pressure overload, the RV seeing systemic pressure because the ventricular septal defect is large uh, and so there's the same pressure uh, in both ventricles in the vast majority of cases. Uh, the pressure in the pulmonary artery of course tends to be normal uh, because of the pulmonary stenosis, at least in, in standard uh, tetralogy of Fallot. If there are collaterals that we'll talk about in a little bit, that can, can be a little bit different. So that's the basic physiology here. Um, <clears throat> there are some associated lesions that we see with tetralogy in a reasonable proportion of cases. Atrial septal defects occur uh, with this, which has been called pentology of, of fellow. Uh, if you like that term, that's fine. Multiple ventricular septal defects occur in up to 10%, depending on the series that you look at. And what it looks like is that the earlier you look at children, the more likely you are to find additional muscular defects. Uh, in the old days when we operated on tetralogy at four, five, six years of age, uh, mus additional muscular defects were less frequently seen, probably because they closed. Uh, but when we see children very early on, it can be, depending on the series that you look at, up to 10%. Branch pulmonary artery stenosis occurs also uh, particularly of the left pulmonary artery in, in a right arch because there's usually a left ductus uh, and it inserts into the left pulmonary artery and one can see a syndrome that's like the reverse of coarctation where in fact the ductus causes constriction not of the aorta as it does in coarctation but of the left pulmonary artery where it inserts into the left pulmonary artery. This is an important thing to know about and to look for, uh, particularly in patients with tetralogy of fallot and pulmonary atresia who may have a, a ductus. Uh, coronary artery abnormalities occur in 05 to 8 percent, uh, and this may be origin of the anterior descending from the right coronary, uh, or a single right coronary, or even a single left coronary with uh, the other coronary crossing in front of the alpha tract. We'll look at an example of that. Right aortic arch occurs in about a quarter of these patients, roughly. Uh, and keep in mind that <clears throat> microdeletion at 22Q11 certainly does occur in some patients with tetralogy of Fallot. There are other syndromes, cardiofacial syndromes, that can be associated with it that are not necessarily associated with this particular deletion, but uh, certainly are associated with abnormalities of speech abnormalities of learning uh, and other uh, sorts of problems. So here's an <clears throat> example of uh, tetralogy. We, we're looking into the opened right ventricle here and what you see uh, is a, a large ventricular septal defect and these are aortic valve leaflets. Uh, this is the uh, papillary muscle of the conus right here that we're demonstrating. So this is the inferior ramus and superior ramus of the septal band, and then the septal band continues down the septum here. Notice that in this case, the infundibular septum, which we see here, is associated with the superior ramus or 
of her leftward ramus susceptible band and is not here closing the Y. So we have a large ventricular septal defect within the Y of septal band. We have the infundibular septum displaced against the free wall here, and this is the pulmonary outflow tract. You see how the displacement of the infundibular septum produces the narrowing of the outflow tract. Now if we turn this up just a little bit, we'll see that the pulmonary valve is actually up here. In this case, this is a very abnormal pulmonary valve. You can see that it's acommissural. Uh, there's a, a solid leaflet all the way around, and there's simply this little hole right in the middle uh, for blood to go through. So this is a very dysplastic, abnormal uh, pulmonary valve that can be associated with the tragedy. Here we see the main pulmonary trunk and then the branch pulmonary arteries up here. So this is a fairly typical uh, example of tetralogy of Fallot. Here's another patient with tetralogy, and now we're looking into the open right atrium here. Uh, <clears throat> in this case, we see a large secundometrial septal defect. So this is one of the things that we said can be associated. Here's the eustachian ridge here, the osteum of coronary sinus there, just to get you oriented, and here we see the tricuspid valve down here. When we open the right ventricle, we see basically the same kind of anatomy. Here's the superior uh, ramus and the septal band is <coughs> down the septum, the inferior ramus of septal band here, and there's the papillary muscle of the conus. <clears throat> Notice that there, in this case, there's a lot of fibrous <coughs> tissue built up up here in the outflow tract. This is the infundibular septum right here that's associated with the superior ramus. <coughs> the aortic valve is behind and the pulmonary valve is in front of that. So there's marked narrowing here between the infundibular septum and the anterior free wall right there. And you can again see this fibrous tissue that's built up in response to the high velocity jet that develops in this area. And you can see that there are thick muscle bundles and hypertrophy of the free wall of the right ventricle here, which also contributes to the right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Now looking from above, we see the area of marked narrowing right here below the valve, but notice in this case, the valve is really nicely formed. Uh, so sometimes in tetralogy, you can have a relatively normal pulmonary valve. And there you, you see the nice leaflets <coughs> three leaflets uh, in this case, and then the pulmonary trunk, which is reasonable size uh, and pretty normal sized branch pulmonary arteries. Oops, sorry. Um, <clears throat> this case is a, a little bit different. This is um, uh, showing an example of, of a patient with a diminutive uh, infundibular septum, which is one of the variants that we see. Here we see the right atrium uh, with the uh, fossa ovalis uh, essentially closed here. Here's the osteum of coronary sinus. And then as we open the right ventricle, here we see the aortic valve leaflets nicely sitting over uh, the septum. Uh, so there's quite a bit of aortic override here. Here's the superior ramus of septal band. Here's the inferior ramus here. And again, the papillary muscle of the conus there marking the inferior ramus. And then the body of septal band as it comes down uh, the interventricular septum. Here are the aortic valve leaflets uh, overriding the interventricular septum there. And in this case, as we look up at the outflow tract, uh, you can begin to see the, the outflow tract here. And there's pulmonary valve leaflets uh, right here. So the aorta and pulmonary artery are very close together, and there's only a very thin fibrous ridge here that separates the aorta and the pulmonary artery. So sometimes uh, in tetralogy, the infundibular septum can be essentially missing uh, or very hypoplastic and fibrous, as in this case, it doesn't develop, it doesn't muscularize, uh, as we know the outflow tract septum usually does. Here again, you see it's associated with the superior ramus instead of being here filling uh, the ventricular septal defect. Here, looked at from above, we see the pulmonary valve leaflets here are somewhat thickened and somewhat small. This is a 
looks like it's a bicuspid, would be a bicuspid <coughs> pulmonary valve. It's been divided, but there are just two leaflets of the valve. <clears throat> and as we go up into the pulmonary trunk, uh, you see uh, the uh, two branches here that have been opened uh, to show that they're really quite normal in size. From the left side, you see the aortic valve leaflets here. This is the septum uh, of the left ventricle here, and here's the anterior mitral leaflet that's in continuity with the uh, aortic valve on the left side. Here's an example of the left pulmonary artery stenosis that I told you about. Here we have a probe coming from the main pulmonary artery into the left, and you can see right here there's a shelf that projects out into the left pulmonary artery. And this is the, like the coarctation shelf produced by the ductus, where the ductus had inserted into the proximal left. And there you can see by echo that uh, this is the area of coarctation of the left uh, pulmonary artery. And with color flow, you can see that it becomes a little bit narrow there. Um, the other thing that we see in tetralogy is um, abnormalities of the coronary arteries, as we said, at about 5 to 8 percent. Here we're just looking into the right ventricle, showing the outflow tract narrowing, the infundibular septum there, the muscle bundles on the free wall. Here's the uh, ventricular septal defect, the Y of septal band here from the inside. Now, when we come back out uh, and look on the surface, we'll see that uh, over here to the left, here's the left coronary artery right here arising normally and there is a circumflex that comes from it and then there's a short coronary that comes down part way uh, from the uh, left coronary that is uh, an anterior descending but it only comes down about a third or a half way down here's the right coronary uh, and here you can see the right main passing in the right AV groove posteriorly and then here is a large branch that comes from the right, that comes down the front of the heart, down right across the outflow tract where one would make an incision, uh, and all the way down to the apex of the heart. So this is the real anterior descending, uh, and it comes from the right. But this shows you one of the uh, pitfalls in that you can have a coronary uh, that comes from the left, that comes part way down, uh, so there are dual anterior descendings. And here you can see the outflow tract narrowing is right at the point where this coronary crosses uh, the, the outflow tract and would be a problem if the surgeon needed to make an incision there uh, to enlarge the outflow. Uh, so here you see this is a large anterior descending. Remember we saw that there was a sm much smaller one that only went a third or halfway down uh, the ventricles that comes from the left. So just seeing a vessel coming from the left is not enough. You have to also exclude a vessel uh, that comes from the right and crosses uh, the outflow tract. <clears throat> and the other variant that we'll talk about is uh, absent pulmonary valve syndrome, which occurs in uh, some patients with tetralogy of Fallot. Here we can see the inside of the heart here. Uh, again, here's the infundibular septum up here uh, coming to the superior uh, ramus up here uh, of septal band, and here septal band as it comes down the interventricular septum the ventricular septal defect being back here in the Y with aortic valve leaflets uh, coming through. There's the papillary muscle, the conus, uh, being indicated there. Now look how big this infundibulum is up here. This is much bigger than anything we've seen so far in tetralogy. And here's where the valve leaflets, the pulmonary valve leaflets should be. There's just a little ridge uh, across here uh, because the valve leaflets are, are essentially absent. They're very dysplastic. There's some narrowing at the annulus, but look at the size of the branch pulmonary arteries. These are just enormous pulmonary arteries as they go out. Here's the left, and then here's the right that's been opened out into the secondary and tertiary branches uh, out into the lung, so you can see that these are just enormous branch pulmonary arteries that extend out into the lung. And the main problem that these babies have is compression of the bronchi by these small, by these uh, large vessels out in the lung. So they usually present with respiratory problems very early in life, uh, and that's uh, really their major problem. The other variant of tetralogy, of course, is tetralogy of fallot with pulmonary atresia. 
And there are a couple of varieties of this. There is a short segment type of atresia where there's a pulmonary trunk that actually comes right down to an atretic pulmonary valve. Usually there are confluent pulmonary arteries in this circumstance and supply is via ductus. Uh, and notice in this case there is a right aortic arch and here's the ductus coming from the base of the innominate artery on the left side because even in a right arch by far the most frequent location for the ductus is left sided uh, coming from the innominate artery here. On the other hand you can have the situation of multiple aortopulmonary collaterals. Uh, usually that's associated with uh, absence of the pulmonary trunk but not always. Um, there may be uh, confluent pulmonary arteries out here. There are usually communications between the real central pulmonary arteries and the uh, collaterals out within the, the lung. The physiology there is uh, a common mixing lesion because uh, obviously there's no way to get blood directly out to the lungs except through the collaterals. So all the blood has to mix uh, within the heart. So here's an example of this. Here we're looking into the open right ventricle. These are uh, aortic leaflets that we see there. Um, someone's done a little bit of repair uh, on this uh, case. And here's the septal band, the inferior ramus here with the papillary muscle that's called the superior ramus and then the body of the septal band here. <clears throat> now the infundibular septum is this part right here. And as we, here's the aorta behind, and here's the infundibular septum. And up here you can see that there is a little translucent area right there, which is an atretic pulmonary valve. Uh, this is where the valve should have developed uh, in this case, but it's, it's completely closed. So if we look from above now, we'll see the, <clears throat> no, we're looking from the left. So there's the, the left ventricular outflow tract here, the ventricular septal defect, and uh, the, the, uh, aortic to mitral continuity. Now here's the, uh, here's from above. <clears throat> you can see the, <clears throat> the raffes here uh, in the pulmonary valve. You can see that it's just not opened at all. The, the valve is completely sealed and there's a small pulmonary trunk that comes up then uh, and branch pulmonary arteries that come out from that right and left. Here's uh, the, the last example I want to show you and this is an an example of a patient with uh, this kind of tetralogy. This was a 42-year-old woman who'd never been operated uh, and died with this. She has terrific calcification of her aortic valve leaflets here. You can't even move them. Um, <clears throat> this is the inside of the right ventricle. We're looking through the ventricular septal defect. So here's the septal band here, the cut moderator band uh, at this point. And there's the papillary muscle, the conus. So this is the inferior ramus down here and the superior ramus up there. <coughs> and here's the, what would be the pulmonary outflow tract uh, in this woman, which was closed at that point. And then if we look from <coughs> up above, we'll see that she has a little fibrous cord that comes down to the ventricle there and there's the proximal main pulmonary trunk uh, which then goes out uh, and has a large right pulmonary artery, thank you, uh, and a smaller uh, left pulmonary artery on the other side there. But she also had multiple aortopulmonary collaterals and looking, uh, this is the left ventricular outflow tract, you can see the, that you simply can't move the aortic valve leaflets there. They were just completely solid with calcium. And she had marked uh, calcific plaque in her ascending aorta too. Here you can see the ridges of calcium down in the valve leaflets. This is her aortic valve leaflet. You can see down in the bottom of it there the, the calcium. Anyway, here are the aorta pulmonary collaterals. This is from the descending aorta. It comes around the trachea here, you can see there are multiple uh, diverticular or little um, um, aneurysms of this. Here's another uh, aortopulmonary collateral here 
that attached uh, up at that point went to the upper lobe of the right lung, and here's a big collateral that goes into the uh, directly into the left lung. So these are what the collateral arteries look like uh, that supply the pulmonary artery in these patients. So I think we'll uh, just say that the typical management for this is repair tetralogy in the first months of life, uh, usually a transatrial transpulmonary approach. Uh, it's less, much less likely nowadays that a transannular patch is done. It really depends on the size of the annulus, but people try to avoid that. And for tetralogy below with pulmonary atresia, usually an initial palliation to uh, maintain pulmonary blood flow um, if it's supplied by a ductus, and then some kind of amalgamation of all these collaterals and central pulmonary arteries into a single uh, uh, point, and then construction of an outflow tract, usually using prosthetic material, something like a homograft or a, 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 a tube of some kind. Uh, and then VSD closure may be delayed depending on the size of the pulmonary arteries and the resistance in the pulmonary arteries uh, uh, to a point where one could close the VSD and have less than systemic pressure uh, within the right ventricle. So. We'll move on to uh, echo. So um, the question that is often asked is, uh, what is Tetralogy of Fallot? I ask my students this all the time, and uh, they always uh, give me uh, the order of preferences in uh, a different order, especially when you're learning by route, you seem to get these things wrong. So the most important feature in Tetralogy of Fallot is what you're seeing here on this uh, um, autopsy specimen, is the deviation of the outlet septum, which is the genetic probably part of the genetic basis of the origin of tetralogy, uh, and that causes subpulmonary stenosis, and that is sometimes called the monology of Stenson. Uh, there's often, uh, well, there's almost a second uh, thing that's important is aortic override with a ventricular septal defect, and if this was a clay model, you could take this piece of clay and put it to cross over the aortic outflow tract that would diminish the, uh, the uh, infundibular obstruction over here and would bring the aorta to override uh, the left ventricle as it does in the normal heart. And right ventricular hypertrophy, the fourth part of the tetralogy, is a consequence of the obstruction that occurs related to the first three items. Now, um, this uh, condition was originally described by uh, Etienne Louis Arthur Fallot uh, in 1888. Those are his dates of birth. And uh, I was uh, in Seattle where his great-grandson, uh, Dr. Fallot, is an intensivist. And uh, as you can see, there's a strong family resemblance from the broad foreheads, uh, the uh, nose and the broad jaw, uh, indicating that this is a genetic condition. 
And um, here is a picture of old Neil Stenson, otherwise known by his Latin name, uh, Stinko. He was a brilliant man, a ge geologist as well as a prelate, and um, uh, had a, certainly uh, an understanding of anatomy and physiology way beyond his years. And he described this condition uh, uh, during his lifetime, which is uh, really uh, almost uh, uh, 200 years uh, prior to uh, the description by Fellow. And I've left these uh, pictures in uh, to show the spiral development of the septum, which is fundamental and under genetic control of the neurocrest uh, mesodermal um, um, uh, that uh, causes the migration of, uh, of tissue uh, to develop the spiral septum, which normally develops uh, between ridges one and three and in a spiral fashion and equally divides the outflow tract. Here's a little cartoon in real time to show uh, these uh, features developing. In Tetralogy, uh, this is the original description by Daniel Gur from 1973, um, it shows the lack of this development and the malalignment that occurs in Tetralogy so that the, um, in, this is the normal heart, but when these septums are malaligned, they cannot fuse one to the other and uh, that leads to the development uh, of uh, Tetralogy of Fallot. Now, as far as echocardiography is concerned, our goals of imaging are to find the extent and position of the VSD and the valve relations, the nature and severity of the right ventricular alpha tract obstruction and the pulmonary valve and its, the, its uh, features uh, that uh, Steve has uh, shown us so beautifully in his um, presentation, the abnormalities of the pulmonary arterial tree, which are significant prognostic features, the morphology and course of the central coronary arteries, which we have to define echocardiographically, uh, arch and brachiocephalic anatomy, which uh, used to be much more important when these patients were shunted, uh, uh, additional sources of pulmonary blood flow, which we'll look at uh, in detail, and the presence of additional uh, septal defects and valvular regurgitation, and lastly, uh, which will be handled by my colleagues, uh, ventricular function. So, Echocardiographically, I've tried to match up a specimen in long axis showing the aortic override of the ventricular septum, the tremendous hypertrophy related largely to the septal band hypertrophy that occurs here. You can see almost a clear division between the septal band and the true septum. So you can see here they separate one from the other. And we can see that in parasternal long axis view. And we can also match our description and understanding of tetralogy showing the aortic override of the ventricular septal defect from uh, the subcostal coronal view as well. You can see that this is a left aortic arch quite clearly. Uh, pulmonary artery seems to be well developed in this condition as it seems to be in the autopsy specimen as well. Now the problems start off in the fetus. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking at the fetus, but you can see here when you originally see the pulmonary artery bifurcation that it's small, uh, that the, the vessel is hypoplastic and bifurcates into the lungs, uh, into both left and right vessels. And here is an example in utero showing uh, the aortic override with a little aortic insufficiency and a separate pulmonary artery arising off the right ventricular infundibulum. Now we can match this example with uh, evaluation of the infundibulum morphology by parasternal imaging, uh, by subcostal, uh, sagittal and coronal images. And there is uh, the uh, match between the pulmonary artery here, the it deviated outlet septum, the ventricular septum. Here's the ventricular septal defect. Here's the deviated outlet septum. And of course, we can't see in three dimensions the other uh, data that's shown here. And here, subcostally, in this, the uh, horizontal view, let me just uh, move through that. I didn't want to play. There we go. And here is the deviated outlet septum with the stenotic pulmonary valve. Here's the doming stenotic pulmonary valve and the deviated outlet septum relating to the so-called third ventricle in Tetralogy of Fallot and the ventricular septal defect seen below here in this example. 
Now, when we look at the monology, we can see this deviated outlet septum in short axis uh, together with the continuation into the pulmonary arteries and also look at the pulmonary valve. And we can add color flow uh, information to show the acceleration of flow occurring clearly within the infundibulum proximal to the small pulmonary valve. And I'll, another example showing that in slow motion. Here's the deviated outlet septum, acceleration of flow in this area, continuating, continuing into the pulmonary artery, and the ventricular septal defect, incidentally, showing a extension into the area of the membranous septum, which is, occurs in about 70% of tetralogy patients, and is one of the reasons why the operation is fraught with hazard from the point of view of the conducting system. And then, of course, the right ventricular hypertrophy as well. Now, Dr. Um, Sanders mentioned the tetralogy with the absent infundibular septum, which uh, Dr. Um, Aldo Castaneda used to call the Mexican tet, simply because there were three patients in one day that he operated on from Mexico with tetralogy of Fallot that all had the same feature. And just as Dr. Fallot and his great-grandson have the same genetic uh, origin, the genetic origin of this is also very interesting because it's very much more frequent in my part of the world, which is the Western United States, or part of the Pacific Rim. And the Pacific Rim is populated by Peach, M Mongolian people, and the, actually the Native American population um, also migrated from Asia across the Bering Sea in the time of the Ice Age, uh, looking for the Promised Land. And uh, they brought with them their genes. It wasn't Jordas and Levi's. It was their... Uh, genes for um, uh, the uh, development of the infundibulum, and as the uh, doubly committed subarterial or supracrystal VSD is more common in our population, so is this form of tetralogy more common in people of Pacific Rim origin and Native Americans. And so you'll see this, and here is an example, just as Dr. Sand has shown, where there is no actually infundibular septum, and there's fibrous continuity between the pulmonary and the aortic valves, and we can see that echocardiographically Here's a normal infundibulum, and here is a patient with tet absent, uh, with an absent infundibular septum. Here's the pulmonary valve, here's the aortic valve, and I'll show you this down below as well with color flow. You can see the aorta and the pulmonary artery, and of course here, um, in the purest sense of terms, this may not be considered tetralogy, but there is a, a, a pulmonary valve ostenosis. And the importance of this for those who believe in palliation is that this is a condition which a balloon valvular plasty might palliate a lot better than uh, infundibular because we know that we can dilate valves and you can temporize on whether you have to do surgery in the young patients uh, 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 that uh, this operation is de destined for. But uh, it obviously requires a lot of supportive conditions to be excellent. So you can do a balloon valvular plasty much more successfully in this population of tetralogies. Now, in looking at uh, the severity, we also can look at the development of the flow velocity across the outflow tract by continuous uh, uh, and pulse Doppler. We have to use continuous largely because of the high velocities. And you can see here a variety of signals that are obtained in different forms of tetralogy. Here's a continuous wave Doppler. The, the continuous wave, as I said, is uh, along all of the lines. It is range ambiguous. Uh, but it's frequency uh, specific. And so you can see here that the velocity across this uh, infundibulum is about 119 millimeters of mercury. But when you look at the signal, it looks almost like a camel with a double hump. And uh, if you look carefully on some of these complexes, you can see an early peaking signal here and a later peaking signal here. And these are contributed by two different areas of stenosis within the right ventricular outflow tract. The first one is clearly valva, and the second one is an infundibulum. So as the infundibulum squeezes, the velocity increases across the outflow tract. Here is a nice example where mainly there is valva obstruction, and you can see the peak velocity here is also fairly high, not quite as high as in this example. But you can see developing late on the infundibular constriction that, uh, that, that occurs during the cardiac cycle, reaching its peak at uh, late systole. And of course here we can separate them out 
if you can, uh, can uh, put them in different areas because uh, the angle is uh, somewhat different, you can uh, isolate the specific velocities in the various parts of the, the cycle. And here again are two other examples. And you can see here if you just move the probe a little bit even in the same patient that you can go and from this mixed signal down to a pure signal of infundibular stenosis and you can change to pulse wave and find those velocities. So um, we can work out what the velocity obstruction is across the right ventricular outflow tract and to a great extent the um, significance of the obstruction in either levels in terms of giving this to the surgeons. The other thing that, that uh, pulmonary valve signal is helpful for is if you look at the signal, it clearly looks like there is stenosis of this valve. But I think um, as you look at it, it doesn't look that bad, but you look at the velocities here, and this is really quite substantial pulmonary stenosis. And of course, there's also a ductus contributing presence of the pulmonary flow and coming towards you, which you can see on this uh, picture. Now, as Dr. Sanders mentioned, is, uh, and one of the important uh, things that we have to do is not only define the infundibular and the valvular morphology, but the, also the branch pulmonary artery anatomy. And the question about whether we can actually uh, do this totally on echo is uh, one which needs your attention, because I think that there are a variety of patients where you cannot see the pulmonary artery branches, and in that circumstance, for the patient's benefit, the patient needs additional forms of evaluation like cardiac catheterization, or as Dr. Asbani will show us, magnetic resonance imaging, which will uh, bring uh, that to our attention. So here you can see a tiny little a seagull, as we call it, looks almost like a bird's wings, of uh, the pulmonary artery, which is characteristic of the uh, severe forms of tetralogy of fallot. Here's a patient who actually underwent a surgical valvotomy at 1,500 grams and has developed secondary, almost total uh, pulmonary atresia here with very small main pulmonary artery but with adequate sized branch pulmonary arteries. Here is a patient who has pulmonary atresia and pulmonary atresia that occurs in tetralogy is of two varieties. 50% of the patients have a sole source of pulmonary blood flow through an arterial duct and here is the ductus, and you can see it's perfusing the right and the left pulmonary arteries, and they are really quite beautiful, and uh, there, doesn't, uh, there isn't any source of additional pulmonary blood flow identified on the ultrasound study, and this patient went and had a, a pulmonary, uh, a right ventricular to pulmonary arterial homograph with division of the ductus, uh, and did extremely well. And here is an example of where I think we can see the right pulmonary artery, and I think is a criteria that we have to identify. Here is the right pulmonary artery, here is the hilum of the lung, and to the point of the hilum of the lung, we can see the pulmonary artery quite beautifully. Okay, another example, in fact, here on this patient, you can even see the epiterial lobe uh, 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 artery here. Um, what I did miss on the previous slide, just let me see if I can find it for you, is that in addition here, in addition to, um, uh, to the ductus constriction, which Dr. Sanders mentioned, is that in the old days, and in some centers still practice today, patients pref uh, are preferred to have a shunt as their primary operation, and then when they grow to a large extent, to reoperate on them and do the formal operation at the later stage. And here's an example of what can happen. This is a BT shunt that went to the right pulmonary artery. And you can see that there is, in this patient, been a development of a cicatrization or scarring related to the BT shunt implantation in the pulmonary artery. So uh, surgery does carry its own morbidity as well. So looking at the branch pulmonary arteries, color flow is incredibly helpful. Here is the left hilum. Here is the right hilum of the lung, and this is a peristernal short axis view. And although the imaging on the, um, uh, the black and white image is not that spectacular, you can see that it's really quite remarkable with the color flow. Again, uh, notice uh, that we've uh, increased the strength of the signal here. There's a little stenosis at the origin of the pulmonary artery, which is easily uh, attackable at surgery. 
and uh, again here a constriction at the site of the right pulmonary artery, sometimes with the right aortic arch, that's where the ductus inserts and becomes very important. So we do look at the arteries. Here's another example of what uh, Dr. Sanders had mentioned. Big main pulmonary artery and bilaterally small left pulmonary arteries and right pulmonary arteries. And here uniformly small right pulmonary artery with the epiterial bronchus going uh, to the hilum over here and the, uh, the, the artery seen all the way to the hilum of the lung. And this is the classical angiographic staghorn type of view of the pulmonary arteries. Now looking at the pulmonary valve is important. I think it's the last frontier in, uh, in uh, the um, tetralogy surgery. Uh, in about 60% of patients, the valve is bicuspid. In this example here, here is a tricuspid uh, pulmonary artery. Here's the aorta. This is parasternal short axis imaging over here. And there is a special thing about imaging this that's important for you because in tetralogy, because of the right ventricular hypertrophy and rotation, the pulmonary trunk switches deeper into the chest. So in order to see this, you have to come high up on the chest wall to see this particular uh, item and you have to rotate the probe round in order to get into the short axis of the vessel. And here are two examples of typical tetralogy of fellow with a bicuspid pulmonary valve. You can see uh, this here as I've reflected it in various areas. And this is terribly important because um, as part of a, a small annulus need sometimes to be enlarged in the operation of tetralogy. And um, because pulmonary insufficiency, as we're going to see now, is one of the big complications of the operation of tetralogy, our surgeons are trying now to preserve as best they can the function of these valves by not interfering with the valve or leaflets. And after surgery, these valves may grow, and eventually you can take out the transannular patch and reestablish the artery with a, a reasonable degree of competence. Unfortunately, if the situation is such where the pulmonary valve or leaflets are running across the area where the incision has to be made, you have to destroy the valve and then you rate the prognosis, the long-term prognosis of that patient uh, in a, 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 a suboptimal way because uh, that patient is going to develop pulmonary insufficiency. So you can see the pulmonary valve parasternally. You can see it uh, subcostally. Here's the aortic arch. Here's the left ventricle. Here's the right ventricle. And you can see the pulmonary artery is traveling backwards to the same plane as the aorta. And here is a perfectly uh, uh, typical uh, bicuspid pulmonary valve. Sometimes there's definitely a need for a transannular patch. And here you see a tricuspid aorta and a bicuspid pulmonary valve. And there's no way that an infundibulotomy can be done here. And in fact, it may be mute because the pulmonary artery is so small that a homograph needs to be placed in order to fix this patient. This is the so-called usual kind of what we call volcano pulmonary valve. It looks like the top of a volcanic peak. Uh, here is the orifice of the valve. There are no specific valve or leaflets here, as there aren't here. You don't see any cusp, but it prolapses up like a volcano in each systole. Okay, peristernal short axis is a nice big thymus in the front here. We have to look at the coronary arteries. The most important thing that we can do for the coronary arteries is look at this picture over here. Because the important issue with tet tetralogy is that not only is the aorta dextraposed, but it's also dextrorotated. So if you look at this cusp here and the normal aorta, this would be the non-coronary cusp. But it's really the left coronary cusp with the left coronary artery, and the left coronary artery is running behind the pulmonary artery over here. So, and you see it dividing into the left anterior descending and the ramus intermedius of the coronary artery. So that's okay, we're gonna talk about that in the session uh, that we see afterwards. And um, then here's just another little caveat. This is a coronary vein that's running with the coronary artery. And here you see the right coronary artery, instead of coming out in its usual position, because of the rotation, is coming out the right coronary cusp, which is defined in this region here. That's the arrow showing the right coronary cusp. And lastly, what Dr. Sanders mentioned in his presentation is the danger and what we have to look at with the echocardiogram is a patient where the left coronary artery is arising 
from the, uh, the right coronary artery, the left anterior descending, he is clearly coming from the right coronary artery. And um, you can see it bifurcating over here. And I think this is good to look at it like this. We can freeze and stop frame these pictures. But in fact, this is what you have to look at. And I think uh, uh, it points out the highlighting, the importance of looking at uh, and stopping your images uh, to look at uh, specific frames of abnormality. Now, not only do we have to look at the normality, we can put color flow in the coronary arteries and see that. And we can see the origin of the right coronary artery coming off the left sinus. And uh, another complication is the conus branch. And you see this patient has a huge conus branch coming across here. This isn't the LAD. This patient had a normal left coronary artery, but there's a big conus branch. In addition, which you may have to sacrifice, there's another artery coming off here in terms of whether you have to do an infant abulotomy. And that's one of the reasons why they try and preserve the annulus and that region of the valve when they do the surgery so that they can keep um, uh, the integrity of the coronary system uh, intact, which is ultimately important for prognosis. Now, the VSDs, we always see the big VSD in tetralogy, but there exist other VSDs, and uh, this is one of the weaknesses of all techniques at recognizing that because blood will tend to go through the bigger hole with the lowest, velocity, uh, the lowest resistance. So we always see the big VSD in tetralogy, and we even see them big in angiography. And here's a patient who's got a sep secondary muscular ventricular septal defect that we found after uh, the surgical closure. Obviously, it's not that important. It's a very small VSD, but sometimes they're even bigger ones. And here is a subcostal view showing the aortic root. Here is... Um, uh, the VSD, a muscular VSD here, separate from the classical VSD of um, um, tetralogy. So secondary VSDs are important. And then you want to prevent yourself making a fool of yourself and calling this a VSD. This is actually the infundibular septum. It looks like there's a shunt going in this direction from left ventricle to right ventricle. Indeed, it's not true. I'd also point out to you that there's a ductus feeding into the main pulmonary artery system here as well. Okay, talking about ductuses, here's the aortic arch, there's the duct. Okay, and uh, that's terribly important, it's particularly in the young infant, because many of these tetralogies may look relatively pink, and they have a ductus which is providing them almost with the physiology of a shunt, and this ductus tends to close, and all of a sudden, the patient goes from a pink tet, as it were, to a critically uh, uh, ill uh, tet. Uh, blue tet uh, that requires surgery. So you need to know about those things and keep uh, th that aware uh, for the parents and, and also for the surgeon. Now this is an image of the aortic arch and uh, what we're looking at here is a suprasternal notch coronal view and we're looking at the left innominate artery bifurcating into the left carotid and the left subclavian. And I always teach my fellows that if you see an artery bifurcating on one side then the aortic arch descends on the other, so bifurcating right innominate with the left descending aorta, and if you have a bifurcating left innominate, you have a right descending aorta. So, very easy, um, and we look at this as a routine, routine basis, and the reason we look at it is because one of the common abnormalities that you get is the so-called diverticulum of comoral, which usually supplies, is a part of a vascular ring, and supplies the left subclavian artery retrograde behind the esophagus. In the old days, we used to do barium swallows on all of our patients that we evaluated. We don't do it. So this is the best uh, test to look for the presence of an anomalous subclavian artery. And here's an aortic arch. Oh. Here's an aortic arch. And the first vessel coming off the aortic arch is going to the left side. This is a subcostal view. Here's the aorta, a large aorta overriding a ventricular septal defect. Here's the artery traveling up here, and the first vessel to branch off it is this vessel here, uh, from the subcostal to the suprasternal view. And this vessel is uh, going to uh, uh, tell you that the arch 
is going to descend on the right side. So arch laterality is important. Now what about the ductus? Here's a patient who has an arterial ductus, okay, and then if the ductus closes, what you have left with is a, a subclavian artery that has a supply only through the circle of Willis, just something like a blaylock talsic So that's an isolated left a subclave, a, a potential isolation as soon as the ductus closes, the subclavian has got a supply only through the circle of Willis. And there's just an angiogram to show you what a right ductus, uh, I beg your pardon, a right aortic arch with a right ductus would look like. And there's the flow into the pulmonary arteries from an angiogram performed uh, over here. Now the atrial septum is a friend of ours in Tetralogy of Fellow. Normally, as you know, there's a higher pressure in the right atrium, so there's a little right to left atrial shunt usually. So when you see a left to right atrial shunt, then you have to think, if this is a patient with tetralogy, and let's assume that it is, why is this patient shunting from the left atrium to the right atrium? And that's usually a pointer to an additional source of pulmonary blood flow, be it a ductus or be it major autopulmonary collaterals, which we'll see as the case in many cases of pulmonary atresia. So when you see a left to right ductus shunt in tetralogy, look out for additional sources of pulmonary blood flow. And here's the atrial septum, which acts like a little windsock, like at an airport, where you see the sock telling you the direction of the wind. The sock tells you the direction of blood flow. It's from left atrium to right atrium. And here is a patient below in whom the shunt windsock of the atrial septum is from right atrium to left atrium, more usually what you'd expect in tetralogy of Fallot. Now, the septum marginal trabeculation. Uh, or the moderator band, or the, uh, uh, the Y of septal band, um, is really, as I showed you on that first pathology specimen, part of the ventricle, but as the ventricle dilates, this band is lifted off the ventricle. So when you see uh, a ventricle that's dilated, you'll often see this freestanding marginal trabeculation. We talked yesterday about Tetralogy of Fallot and uh, AV Canal, and so we'll just revisit it. There's a heart that looks like a Tetralogy here with a deviated outlet septum, a large malalignment VSD, small pulmonary arteries. And if we look at this patient from the subcostal view, you can see here that this uh, AV Canal is going right through the ventricle, matched up with this specimen, which I got from Dr. Diane Spicer and you see the AV canal going across from the uh, left side and attaching to papri muscle uh, uh, in the right ventricle. Now, um, not all tetralogies are isolated. This is a patient with tetralogy who has additional spongy myocardium, and you can see very beautifully with the color flow how the spongy myocardium highlights the crypts of the vessels. Not, also called isolated non-compaction. Dr. Sanders very uh, nicely described um, some of the major autopulmonary collaterals and additional sources of pulmonary blood flow that occur in tetralogy. And here with color flow, we can see some of these minor secondary collaterals. And the major ones that come off the descending aorta, as he had shown us, and which I'm showing you here, they usually run in a cranial direction because the lung starts off in the lower coelomic cavity and moves up into the chest and as it does it, it takes the aortic arterial supply which become major aortopulmonary collaterals. So these collaterals tend to run in a more cranial, caudal to cranial direction. A ductus, as we saw earlier on when there's a problem in utero, goes from a cranial to a caudal direction. So the directionality of flow will tell you something about the origin of, the, of these vessels. Now, they're very big here, as you can see, obviously would be associated with a left to right atrial shunt. But when you find something like this, there is no question that you're going to have to do another procedure. And the question is, do you do MRI or you do angiography with uh, interventional cardiology involved in this? And the answer from our institution is that you do um, uh, angiography. And the reason is that when you do the anastomosis of those vessels, which I'll show you in a moment, that you need to know which ones you have to collect 
because you need to know which one has got competitive flow and what is important to ligate and what is important to anastomose. And you can't tell that from magnetic resonance imaging or CINE CT. So what do these mapkas look like? This is a, comes from a paper, this is my picture, but comes from a paper from Jeff Smallhorn who pointed out that the arterial ducts usually drain into the proximal part of the pulmonary circulation. But these major aorta pulmonary collaterals or bronchial vessels, they come at the hilum. So here you see the hilum of the lung here. This is a short axis view. Here's the uh, main pulmonary artery bulb. Here's this little origin of the pulmonary artery, whether it's a native pulmonary artery or not, we, we don't know. But you can clearly see that the flow is starting where this arrow is and moving across here. Here's a subcostal view. Uh, and you see here's the descending aorta. And here's this MAPCA or major aorta pulmonary artery collateral, MAPCA is uh, just easier to say, running across here, supplying the left lung, running across the midline and supplying the right lung. So very important that you are able to recognize this. And um, uh, in addition here, you can see in this patient a teeny weeny native pulmonary artery uh, confluence over here. It's not going to be useful but it's there as part of the um, uh, development of the outflow tract. And the operation that this is done on this is here to take all of these vessels off one, two, three, four, five, anastomose them all together, put them into a conduit, and then drain the conduit to the, to the, uh, to the uh, right ventricle and close the, or, or leave the ventricular septal defect open depending upon what it looks like. And this is what these mapkas generally look like when you see them uh, on angiography as well. All right, so there's the left to right shunt telling us that they're MAPCAS. And as far as operation is concerned, uh, this is an operation that uh, is performed uh, with some frequency. You may see one case a year of this if you're a cardiologist. We see five or six cases a week because uh, we have an international referral for surgery here. So this is what a mapka looks like, here's the angiograms, here's that tiny little weeny central pulmonary artery, so we've drawn that in purple, and then here are the mapkas, and this could be repaired as a one-stage unifocalization. In other words, this would be connected to this one, this one would join over here, and this one would join up just as the cartoon showed, and they join all together and you put them into a central pulmonary artery, fix the pulmonary artery, and then decide on the basis of the surgical technique, which is not important here, whether you anastomose it or not. When you see tiny pulmonary arteries like this tragically, then you have to unifocalize them and put in a shunt to get pulmonary growth. And we believe in doing this in young patients because the most important thing for pulmonary circulation is the um, development of a good pulsatile arterial flow for the development of vessels. If you don't do that early, then you get what Dr. Sanders showed us on his older specimen, where you get big dilated vessels and uh, uh, endothelial vascularization in the central pulmonary arteries and blockage, and you have a patient who is not operable, that uh, at the best needs a lung, bilateral lung transplant, and maybe even a heart transplant. Sometimes you see vessels like this, where you have a central pulmonary artery here. Here's the central pulmonary artery. And here is one vessel here, and these we put together with what we call an aortopulmonary window. They take this vessel and they open it up on this uh, area here and anastomose it to uh, the aorta, uh, usually the ascending aorta which runs right over here, and then we let the vessels grow and then fix them at a later stage. And this one, again, this is somebody that has got so many vessels, you can't do this all together. And you can't put these patients on bypass for the 10 to 14 hours that these operations take. And in this particular circumstance, you would choose to do one vast vessel at a time. And you would choose the left pulmonary artery here because at least the patient can perfuse itself on the collateral vessels here. Anastomose the left side, let them grow. When they grow, do it again, and, but this time unifocalizing these and then later bringing them all together into a conduit and fixing them. And as I mentioned, and I was showing you here, that although that's only 50% of TET pulmonary atresias, this is the other 50%, and you can see here the angiogram done through a right um, aortic arch with a right ductus, 
uh, into the pulmonary artery and you can clearly see that this is a vertically oriented vessel that's much more likely to be an arterial ductus. <clears throat> here I showed you this before, it's the same patient again. And the angiograms here show first there that that's the sole source. All of the segments of the lung are perfused from these pulmonary arteries and even when you get closer towards the, uh, the central pulmonary artery, uh, excellent perfusion of all of those vessels. Now, this is just a way of preventing embarrassment because very frequently in these conditions, the uh, innominate vein, instead of running in front of the aortic arch, runs behind the aortic arch. That's called a retro innominate aortic vein. And it usually looks something like this second example. There are many different variations. And it runs into the SVC and it's not a problem. The problem is when you start confusing it with the pulmonary artery. And here color flow has prevented it. It looks like a nice pulmonary artery, but essentially it's a left superior vena cava coming down uh, uh, as a left innominate vein and joining up with the right innominate vein on the other side and draining into a right superior vena ca uh, cava and right atrium. So you don't want to make a fool of yourself by calling that a well-developed pulmonary artery, which it's not. Here's this little pulmonary artery and here's the retroaortic innominate vein crossing underneath the aortic arch over here. Okay. And tet absent pulmonary valve, uh, uh, this is actually a, a specimen that I obtained from a 19-week fetus uh, where we diagnosed this in utero as a tet absent pulmonary valve. Here's the ventricular septal defect. Here you can see, just as Dr. Sanders has shown us, there's no real flow, uh, uh, valve development, but massively enlarged branch pulmonary arteries. Here's the trachea just for comparison and look at the size of the right and the left pulmonary arteries. That, of course, is very important. When you look here at the infundibulum, here's this little fibrous separation between the right, from looking from the right ventricular outflow tract at the pulmonary vessel here. And what you see is minimal development of a crenellated type of a membrane which uh, doesn't open and doesn't shut. So it causes stenosis and insufficiency and the normally developed aortic valve. And when you look at color flow, you can see, uh, maybe not on that picture, maybe on this picture here, you see the color flow of the flow going backwards and forwards across the pulmonary valve and that it both causes stenosis from the narrowing of the annulus as well as insufficiency. And this is a cine CT showing the tracheobronchial tree and because of these large pulmonary arteries, that the bronchi are maldeveloped, and this is really the biggest problem in terms of uh, fixing uh, these patients. And of course the infundibulum, under this circumstance, because of the fetal pulmonary insufficiency, uh, develops uh, much more uh, than it would in a normal tetralogy, and you see nice big outflow signals. And then once again, the caveat is when the pulmonary arteries are bigger than the aorta, you have a real problem. Um, intraoperative and postoperative echocardiography, we watch the surgeons doing this and we fix them with transesophageal echo. Here's a patient with the residual VSD. The right ventricular pressure is still high, so there's bidirectional shunting across the VSD here. Here's mitral valve, here's the aorta, here's the VSD patch, and at the lower end of the patch there's a residual defect. And then that is something that we go with the surgeons and look at the saturation differences and so on and decide whether to return the patient to cardiopulmonary bypass or not. And this is the standard transesophageal view. And we can tell the surgeon exactly where the VSD leak is here from two-dimensional echocardiography. We can say, yeah, when you look in the tricuspid valve, go down to the lower part of the patch, which is the hardest place for the surgeon to suture his sutures on, and that's where the residual VSD is, and he can fix it. Sometimes it's bigger than that and there's no question that this patient is going to return to bypass. And this VSD is at the top end of the patch at the place where it's anastomosed to the aortic root. Again with bidirectional shunting. And here's a, just a look at the ventricular septal defect patch. The patch is pericardium. There's plegated sutures and you can see very beautifully how uh, exquisite the uh, transesophageal echo is at defining this as you see the plegated sutures here very well. The conduits I frequently have to put in. 
uh, conduits need to be put in again and again and again in lifetime. And so um, we call it a gold mine uh, because it requires many echocardiograms. And you can see even er e immediately after it's been placed in, many of these conduits have a little leak in them as well. And uh, you can see that um, they um, have done something to change the dimension of the right ventricular outflow tract. And after a period of time, they calcify, uh, just as uh, Dr. Sanders had showed us with some of the uh, native aortic valves. The valves do it at a much increased rate. And there you see an example of an old-fashioned conduit with a porcine valve in it, which has already become uh, grossly abnormal, and the uh, results of stenosis and insufficiency of these valves. And you see that not only does the conduit um, become stenotic, but it actually can decrease its size from its original report as it's pulled and elongated during growth and development. So we have stenosis and we have insufficiency from these structures. And you can see how tight this can be, and it's remarkable that even though this is the sole entrance into the pulmonary artery, these patients remain relatively asymptomatic. That's a picture from a female uh, uh, a physician that uh, eventually underwent um, a, a repair of her uh, conduit at our institution. And uh, her conduit fit on my little finger when it was taken out, and it was at least a 16 millimeter conduit to start off with. So a tight ring. Now, I'm not going to say too much about ventricular function. We can see bad function on the ventricles, but my colleagues here are going to be very eloquent and erudite about that, and I'm not going to say anything more about it. <coughs> Tricuspid regurgitation is part of this lesion, and of course, so is depressed myocardial function. Ever so often, you see patients coming off bypass which really do very, very poorly. So I'm going to stop at this point in time because I think I've um, exhausted my time, and we have to be very valuable.